Uh, my name is DJ Chuang. I'm digital ministry architect at forministry.com, which is an minist- internet ministry of American Bible Society. Uh, I blog on my personal site. Uh, well, I blog on the Four Ministry site. I also blog on my personal site, djchuang.com. And uh, I've been blogging since 1999 when the thing was just start- starting. Good morning. My name is Stephen Shields. I'm the principal and founder of uh, faithmaps.org. I um, also have a blog, which is faithmaps.blogspot.com. And um, also, since May of 2001, I've moderated uh, an online group of about 250 people that posts between 800 and 1,000 emails a month. Um, and for my day job, I work for USA Today. I'm USA Today's um, National Home Delivery Circulation Manager, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Good morning. My name is Will Sampson. I'm an independent technology consultant, and uh, I do blog. On a personal blog, I also blog for the American Bible Society. Good morning. My name is Steve Knight, and um, I have three blogs. I have a personal blog at nightopia.com slash journal. Um, I also have a reality television blog, which is a collaborative project um, called realityblogs.com. And I have a local blog, which is uh, satirical, called GastonCountySpectator.com um, for the region that I live in. Uh, these are personal projects. My day job um, is as senior internet editor for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And I've been blogging for uh, about a year and a half. I'm Nick Siski. I work... My day job is at Bethany Press, which is a major Christian book printer in Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, Gaston County Spectator is not working today, Steve. Sorry. Um, I also blog personally on uh, my website, nicksiski.com slash blog. I also have a blog about creativity in the church. It's actually a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Communal blog. There's a bunch of people who blog with me on that. And I'm, I'm a podcaster. I podcast church sermons and um, a couple of other podcasts. Um, I think Will had uh, thrown out a question or a series of questions earlier. just want to kind of gauge um, where everyone is coming from um, so that we can tailor our comments um, for you this morning. Um, Well, do we have that list? The envelope, please. Hi, Mom. We're streaming on the Internet right now, right? Good. We have some new, brand new to blogging people. This is exciting. Okay, cool. Um, so let's, let's start there. Let's start with the basics, um, which is uh, what is a blog? Um, a blog, it, blog is short for web log, which is a type of online journal. Um, that has several key characteristics, um, one of which is reverse chronological posts. Um, uh, Everything that you post is dated, and uh, so the most recent post is at the top um, of the page. Um, There's there's, uh, quite a few different blogging softwares that are free and available. There are others that you can pay for. Um, Let's maybe just do a, a quick rundown of or if anybody wants to jump in and comment on some other distinctives of a blog and then what some of those other, uh, what those popular platforms are. One distinctive of a blog that is is not um, necessarily on a website is commenting. That's a really big thing. Blogs are a conversation. They're a discussion, meaning that it's your show. You get to determine the topics that are talked about, but if you're a good blogger, you don't have to turn comments on, but you should. It allows anybody on the internet who comes across your post to leave comments on it, to correct you or to offer their opinion or to um, kind of add to the discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah. 59. Here's an example of a guy. Now, now in a minute, we're going to talk about 
why not to use this beautiful sacred space for goofy April Fool's jokes. <laughs> but, but here's a guy uh, who's a very popular blogger, a friend of a lot of us, a guy named Adam Cleveland, who's a Princeton Seminary student, who uh, yesterday um, put up an April Fool's joke and got, yeah, go to the bottom, if you will, and got 57 comments. So essentially what he's doing is creating a conversation there. So he turned on comments. He created, he put something out there, and then people commented on that. And often what you'll get is sub-conversations, so people will actually begin to comment on the comments. Um, so actually in the comments themselves, people began to have a conversation. So that, that just gives you some context for what comments are. Um, another thing is, is called a trackback. And what that does is, is if I write a post about someone else's post, I can um, track back that or ping it. And basically what that does is it puts a little thing on his post saying that I talked about his post so that people can say, see, oh, there's more conversation about this topic over here. So it, it becomes this mesh, this, this little mini web of discussion about certain topics. And then as bloggers link to each other, as we always tend to do, you start to, if you read somebody's blog, you'll find out who they read and who their friends are, and you can start to read them. And so you start to see, it starts to form this community, this group of people all talking about the same thing, talking about each other, talking to each other, and, and it's this huge conversation, but it's all like an individual weblog. So it's a really kind of cool phenomenon to like find somebody's weblog that you, you didn't know existed. They, you know, they're in Australia or they're somewhere else in the world. And then you start to find their friends. You start reading their blogs. And you get involved in this conversation you would never hear without weblogs being on the Internet. Uh, trackback is a, is a technology that um, is, is built into a lot of blog uh, software. Um, it's, it, uh, it's something that kind of happens behind the scenes. You don't necessarily have to know a lot um, to take advantage of it. There, there are certain um, blog um, softwares that don't um, use uh, trackback. Um, the, one of the most popular blogging applications um, is blogger.com. Um, you can set up a blog on Blogger in about five minutes. Um, they'll host it for free for you on their uh, hosting service, which is blogspot.com. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the conference blog uh, is, is set up on Blogger. It's, it's a really simple and easy to use um, platform, and, it, and it's something that uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's one of the most popular out there. Let's give a quick rundown. I, I use um, Blogger for one of my blogs. I also use Movable Type, which is um, I, I, I need friends like Nick who are more technologically savvy um, to help me set up Movable Type. It's uh, something that you can um, have set up with your uh, ISP and it, you install it on the, your server and you have to configure things and other techie stuff like that. And um, so it's not for everyone, um, but it's, it, it offers, it's more feature rich. It, it, it offers more um, capabilities and functionality that you won't get from Blogger or some of the other uh, free uh, blogging uh, platforms out there. What else do you guys use and what do you recommend and why? Um, well, I, I actually started with Blogger. The reason I moved from it uh, was because it didn't, Blogger does not have trackbacks. And maybe, maybe let me just take a minute to talk about why, why I blog just briefly, which is the whole idea of being in conversation with other people. So, um, so blogging can feel sort of one way, but really what blogging is is, is really more of a two-way conversation. If you ever get a chance, there's a book I'll recommend very strongly to you. It's a book called Clue Train Manifesto. And be all the Internet evangelism books are great. Frankly, the, the best Internet evangelism book you will ever read is Clue Train Manifesto by four guys. It's not a, it's not a quote-unquote Christian book, but by four guys, by Rick Levine, um, Doc Searles, David Weinberger, and Christopher Locke. Um, and it's a, a, about the idea that the web is creating all new, all new places for conversations to take place. And what's happening in a blog is a conversation. And, and so what you want to really be thinking about is what's going to allow the best conversation to take place. Um, not just me sort of throwing a thought out there and, and, like, getting people to read it, but me creating a space for a conversation to take place. So that's where comments come in because I can put a, com I can put a thought out there and, a, and people can make a comment. 
A track back, as, as Nick pointed out, is another method for a conversation. So, so Nick writes something that's really great, and then I say, wow, I want to, I want to continue this conversation. So I'm going to reference what Nick wrote. I'm going to track back to that conversation, to what Nick wrote. And then I'm going to continue the conversation. I'm going to comment on it as well. I might write a post about it. So, so I use TypePad because the, that, that uh, seems to work best for me. Um, that, if that answers you. How much does it cost? Yeah, now, now you should know that Blogger's free. It doesn't include trackbacks, but it is free. TypePad costs money. Um, and I also use TypePad because it allows me to have multiple blogs. And I have severe uh, ADD and am likely to just create a blog on, the whim, on, the, on, on a whim. Um, and so, um, so I, I currently have two or three other blogs that, that I didn't publish because they're in various states of lameness. Um, and, and it also allows you to have multiple authors. So uh, Nick talked about the idea of communal blogging, which I think is also important, particularly if you're doing it around the idea of a church or if you're doing it around sort of group evangelistic activities. So if you're trying to do things where multiple people are authoring the blog, then you need to look at um, group blogging. And TypePad does allow you to do multiple authors. Now, so does Blogger as well, and actually a, a lot of them do. But TypePad allows you to do, to do uh, multiple authors. So, uh, One URL you definitely want to write down is nicksiske.com, N-I-C-K-C-I-S-K-E.com. The reason I say that is because Nick has uh, graciously agreed that he's going to put up a page where we can all go to that will have links to the various different URLs that we're going. Yes. Yeah, he's going to actually bring it up. nicksiske.com, N I C K. C I S K E dot com. It's up on the screen. It's up on the screen. And he's going to build a page for us that will have all the various URLs. He knows this. I talked to him. <laughs> that will have all the various URLs that we uh, refer to. And maybe we can also include, Nick, a couple of uh, links to good articles on what is blogging that will serve as an introduction for you. I, I use Blogger myself. It, it meets all my needs. I've been using it for a couple of years, and I think it's fantastic. But if you want more bells and whistles, there are other good tools out there. And DJ's going to talk about his very favorite right now. Uh, my, my current very favorite one is WordPress, which is an open source, free blogging tool that's gained enormous popularity. Uh, a friend of ours who's not techie installed it in 10 minutes and had it up and running. And it's very customizable, very powerful. Um, since I've blog, been blogging since, since 1999, I've switched software almost once a year, just as the whole revolution has um, matured over the years. So uh, two of the other very popular blogging tools, just for your reference, is Zanga, X-A-N-G-A, and LiveJournal.com. So those two are very popular, and what's nice about Using a popular blog software, as you can find other people that can help you with technical issues or find other people using the same thing. To give you a sense of how big of a revolution this is, there's uh, currently over 8 million blogs in the world, and the number doubles every five months. And so there's a lot of individuals as well as institutions that are blogging as a means of communication. It started out as a metaphor for online journaling or online diary, and now it's become an uh, individual communication tool or corporate communication tool, and it allows the fostering of transparency, which is a, a, a good thing and a scary thing at the same time because what you say instantly gets registered onto something uh, like search engines. There's search engines specifically for blogs. so. If you say something about a product, if you say something about an organization, if you say something about yourself, it's out there for the world to see in 10 minutes or, or less. And so um, if you think about the publishing revolution that was started uh, in 1500 with the Gutenberg Press, that gave uh, power and voice to the institution. And now blogging has given voice to the individual and you can instantly put your voice out. And if you have something to say and it shows up on people's radar, um, you, you can influence the world. And you've seen the impact of blogging in politics, in media, 
um, and certainly in evangelism. Um, just, to, just to sort of follow up on that thought um, with what DJ said, and, and I'm sort of the, uh, we, we come across the whole spectrum here with, uh, in, terms of, in terms of what motivates us and why we're here. Um, I'm the one that always comes back to sort of the, the higher principles, and, and that sometimes gets me in trouble, and we I don't say... Have any higher <laughs> so these guys are great techies, and, and I, I do a lot of technical things myself, but um, I think it's important to remember uh, to have sort of a theory of missions behind what you do. So, so, so if you look at what's been happening in, in missiology, um, and by missiology, I just mean the study of missions over the last 50 years, we've, we've realized that, that something went terribly wrong in Western missions. Um, and, and if you read books uh, like Gospel in a Pluralist Society by Leslie Newbegin or Transforming Mission by David Bosch or any of those sort of greater uh, sort of missiological texts, we understand that um, missions really only works when you are part of the culture and when you are indigenous to the culture. And, and I offer that as a kind of a caution because there can be a real, there can be a real danger with the idea that um, I'm going to evangelize on the web. Um, and it, it's, it's the same danger with the notion that we were going to sort of bring Western Christianity to places um, in, in the East and in, and in Africa and in some other places. And really, it, it, kind, of, it kind of failed. It failed miserably. And it, it, it wasn't until we kind of pulled out that you saw this massive global spread of Christianity. Um, and I, and I, so I think in the same way that, that as you come to, as you, as you think about coming onto the web and, and blogging and, and all these other things, I would just sort of issue a statement that to be both humble and to really be an inhabitant of digital culture if you're going to do that. Um, and that just sort of comes off what, what DJ said, because it, it seems to me that there's, there's a real danger to coming in from the, coming in from the outside. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know where that fits, but. Well, um, just kind of um, bouncing off of that, moving uh, or, or at least, you know, following along that path and talking about philosophy and mindset behind um, blogging, and, and why that um, may be an effective uh, uh, way of doing ministry on the web for, for, for whatever you're doing, um, whether it's a missions or a church back uh, situation or, or whatever. Um, just um, I started a, a reality television blog um, based around really two things. One was uh, the, using reality television as a bridge strategy to say, you know, there's a lot, um, there, our, our culture has a fascination with reality television, and why is that? What is reality television tapping into that um, is so attractive? And um, I, I, on, on, on my reality television site, I tie that into what Leonard Sweet calls EPIC, E-P-I-C, which stands for Experiential, Participatory, Image-Based, and Connective. And that, that's an acronym that he uses and talks about what um, our culture is searching for um, and, uh, and, and how reality television really um, addresses a lot of those things. And um, I also just love reality TV shows. Um, I, you know, I just, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of junk um, because they keep trying to come up with, like, the next great one, and they're all bad. But... Um, uh, but there's a lot of a lot of interesting and a lot of good stuff that happens there, and to be able to talk about that and 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 to it to that niche um, and and to that segment of the population, which is a fairly large segment of the population who watches reality television shows, um, uh, it wouldn't it would be inauthentic for me to just look at statistics and say you know there's millions of people who watch reality television shows. I mean, I don't watch reality television shows, but I'm, I want to reach people who watch reality television shows. So I'm going to start a reality television website and, and talk about that. Um, if, you, if, if it's not something that you're truly passionate about, it, it's, it's going to quickly be discovered on the web that, you know, this guy doesn't really, he's not, you know, this is, this is really a, a ploy, you know. This is a bait and switch um, kind of situation. Yeah, and if, if I can sort of track back off of that. Um, Extend the metaphor. Um, the, it seems to me that what, what blogging can do is 
point people to an understanding of what it means to follow God in the way of Jesus and, and possibly bring, bring us to times where we can um, begin to talk to people about what it means to follow God in the way of Jesus. Um, but, but we need to be able to um, open up the whole story. Um, even, you know, I was thinking as, um, as Dr. Houston was preaching this morning, just the, just the idea of Matthew 25, and, and I love the parable of the talents, but I, but I love it in part because, it's because, of, because of the whole sermon of Matthew 25. The parable of the talents is, is, is such an interesting, the, or Matthew 25 is such an interesting sermon. The parable of the talents being just sort of the first half of the sermon, the whole sermon goes on. What does Jesus say? He says, well, I'm going to judge you by how you use the resources. And what's the evaluation for how we use the resources? Well, then he goes on to say it's the parable of the sheep and the goats, how you care for the least among you. And that's the idea of this, this notion of sort of creating radical communities of faith that actually care for the people around you. And it seems to me that we have this opportunity to help point people to examples of how to create radical communities of faith. And we can... Um, we can use this wonderful space we've got in, in, in the blogging world to sort of try to market Jesus to them, or we can, we can point them to um, new expressions, new radical, back, we can point them back to radical expressions of faith, and really the choice is ours. Well, I, one thing that I wanted to comment on with regards to uh, blogging, I do think community community and the message that we have are the two most important parts, uh, points when it comes to blogging. But one thing that we really have to seek to avoid is an unwarranted technological triumphalism when it comes to blogging. We need to really recognize the limits of what we have um, with blogging. When you think about um, the things that have really been spiritually transformative in your, in your life, usually you're not naming books and sermons. It's usually people that you know. It's usually people who've had a personal impact on you. And the Internet, both in terms of blogging, also in terms of uh, Internet groups, discussion groups, chat, room, chat rooms, has an interesting dynamic that Dr. Houston uh, addressed briefly this morning, and that is the anonymity of it enables people to be more open than they normally would. I call it, um, I say that the Internet has an optional relationality. And that is, if I go on Steve's site and I'm not into reality television, I can easily make Steve go away. I can easily just delete him from my blog lines and not read his blog. If we meet on a discussion group and I don't like what he says, I can just easily leave the discussion group. If he and I exchange personal emails, I can write a, a rule in my Outlook that will cause all of his emails to go right to my deleted folders. About a year ago, Steve and I met, and the moment we met, the stakes instantly went up enormously higher. He was no longer mere, merely a URL. He was no longer merely an email address. But we met, our families met, our children met, and we had an unmediated face-to-face -face relationship. That being said, there can be a significant degree of intimacy that develops online, what I call a virtually unmediated relationship, where you can get down to brass tacks and talk about one another's lives. And the dynamic that I've seen in our discussion group, the Faith Maps discussion group that we've had the last four years, is that people open up usually earlier and usually more intimately than they would face to face in an online environment. And then they get, as it were, tricked into a genuine friendship because then once they develop a level of trust, the relationship can segue from online to real-time face-to-face. And that is one way that I think that we need to look at blogging, we need to look at online. It's a segue ministry to try to help people transform and move into genuine face-to-face -face relationships. Now, I'm not, not trying to say that that can't happen online. It absolutely can. But I think we have to recognize its limits. The other caution that I'll make about blogging is that uh, and when you think about the different types of things you can do online, you've got your 
your website, your static website, which is merely content. And then a little bit more inactive is blogging. But still, when I'm on Will's site, it's Will's show. I mean, I'm just commenting on what he says, and it's his show. And then more interactive than that would be the discussion groups and the chat rooms where it's more egalitarian. People are speaking more at, at an equal level. So I think that's two cautions that we have to look at with blogging. And I think uh, Steve Steve seems to really be anxious, if you all noticed that, to make a comment based on things that I've just said. Now, I'm not sure why, but let's find out. I'm wondering if you can just go a little bit further um, for anyone out there who might be thinking, um, we pretty much have a static brochure type website now. We want to add more community, more interactivity. Uh, should I do a blog? Should I start a message board? What What is the, um, may, maybe talk a little bit more about the distinct, the conversation that happens on a blog versus the conversations that happen on a discussion board. Well, one thing I should say about a discussion board, it, it needs to definitely, you need to definitely have a moderator. Anybody, for example, we've had Faith Maps, the discussion group going since May of 2001, and, and like I said, it's about, we have about 800 to 1,000 emails a month, and I'm the moderator, and, and when I leave in, on travel and I'm not hooked up as much as I think I'm going to be, I have other people who step in and be co-moderators, and the one criterion of participation that's absolutely non-negotiable is respect. Um, you, you can say anything, you can disagree with anything, you can discuss anything, but the one thing you can't do is jump into ad hominems and start talking about people being stupid or I can't, that's the most... You can say that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard, but you can't say you are ridiculous or anything like that. And uh, when that happens in a discussion group, you have a certain amount of power to stop that sort of thing because you can ban someone from your group or you can moderate all their messages so that you read all of their messages before they get posted. And that's worked out uh, really well the last four years. That's probably the best way to really get a discussion going. Um, if you're a small church or maybe that you only want to have a discussion between four or five people who need to say various things, you might have a group blog where a smaller number of people can post to the blog and then make an interaction. Um, and then the third level of discussion that you have that we mentioned earlier is with comments where one person posts something and then you can have a sub-conversation relative to that one post that's around whatever that they did and that of course, that gives a priority to what the one person said, so that's a little bit more broadcast than that. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I, I guess oh, when I look at that question, it's a strategy question, and strategy flows out of your goals and your resources. And um, Ford Ministry provides a church website building tool that's web-based so that no, uh, people can build a website for free. It's donor-supported and and Churches don't have to learn HTML. And what we found, even though we've lowered the threshold on coming on, online with technology, is the question of time. And the message this morning alluded to the issue of time, that we all have the same amount of time, and we have to make choices uh, on where to use that. So one of the other factors, in addition to what's been shared, is how much time does your staff and volunteer have to support a blog or to support a message board. And I found that message boards are much more time intensive than blogs. Um, because you do need to moderate, but the conversations just explode if people find engaging conversation. Um, just on the subject of, of strategy, lest I lose my credibility as the um, wild out there voice, um, you know, um, just coming off of something Stephen said earlier, um, we were talking this morning at breakfast, and, and somebody quoted a guy named Dave Burkhams, who, who I do not know, but he, he made the statement, we win people to what we win them with. I'll repeat that. We win people to what we win them with. And um, I think that's we win people to what we win them with. Right, okay, sorry. We win... We win people to what we win them with. Sorry. Forgive the, forgive the improper cadence there. And um, I was just thinking of John 6, 
Um, so in John 6, if you, re- if you recall that Jesus um, fed the disciples, or, or, fed, or fed the 5,000 rather, and then, and then all the people came to him, and Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And, and if, you, if you look around this culture, I mean, what was the number one rap song this year? Jesus Walks, right, Kane West. What was the number one R&B song last year? Where is the love? Black Eyed Peas. Father, 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 help us with some guidance from above. Because people got me questioning, where is the love? Huh? What's that? There is, there is so much desperate desire for spirituality in this culture. And, and if we try to market Jesus, and if we provide an inauthentic relationship by saying, come to Jesus and, and your marriage will be cured, or come to Jesus and, and, and this problem will be fixed. Well, if the problem doesn't get fixed, guess what? They're going to go to the next person offering a solution for that problem. If, on the other hand, we offer people the chance to be part of the radical call of Jesus, to drop their nets, leave everything they have, and follow Jesus, which is, just, which is a radical call in a, in a highly individualistic, highly consumeristic culture, then we have a real chance of getting people to follow the radical call of Christ. And blogging is, we're just at this interesting time where people are just highly interested in it and actually reading these things. We're going to get to the point where they're, where they're oversaturated saturated and people are going to stop reading them. But right now, people are reading a ton of blogs, and I think we need to take advantage of that time and offer a realistic vision of the radical call of Christ. All right, so we've been talking a lot up here, and hopefully something that we've said has maybe sparked some, some questions, some thoughts. Um, I talked to a few people yesterday. I think everybody I talked to who, um, you know, was polite enough to say, yeah, I'm coming to your session. Um, I actually see one person. Yeah. Um, uh, I said, bring, bring your questions. We definitely want to uh, uh, just uh, open this up for discussion and uh, uh, so yeah does anybody have anything they want to just uh, jump in and throw at us yeah The, the question is, um, in Blogger, um, I, I don't think you actually asked this question. I heard you starting to ask the question, like, how do you get the conversation started in the comments? And, and, and then the, 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 met, the, 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 the kind of the technical question is, when people post the comment, does it actually come up? Uh, every uh, post um, that you create will, will show up on your main page, but then there will also be what's called a permalink that, uh, that, 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 that uh, is like the, a unique page that is created for that post. And different, different uh, so, you know, Blogger does it different, a little bit differently. But, um, you know, essentially there will be a, a link there that says comments, and people will be – either it will show up on, on that page or it will show up in a little window. or um, it'll, it, There's a little counter there that says, you know, you know there's this many comments and, and – and, and, uh, um, the question, okay. Um, as you, I'm a, I got Blogger right here. It shows how many comments there are on this post. And Blogger links the date to the permalink. It's really annoying because I should link the title to the permalink. Good for search engines. Uh, most other web blog softwares do that. So um, here's the thing. If you really want to do stuff like that, stay, shy away from Blogger. Look more into like TypePad or Movable Type or WordPress. WordPress is super customizable. you got to know... You might not need to know PHP. There's lots of great plugins. So, I mean, like, look around, see what plugins are available for your, pu- for your publishing platform, and there's lots of stuff where people have already done the work. 
you pop it in, you hit OK, and your comments are on the home page or your comments are in the sidebar or stuff like that. So it's really easy to kind of move stuff around because all this is just data in a database. So it's easy to move it around and display it however you want. It doesn't have to look like every other blog. Was part of your question also how to entice people to come and make comments? What's your audience? Anybody or your church, your particular local church? Your uh, a local church? Okay. One, okay. One thing you should do then can do is to put information on your blog that um, they need to know, that they need to have, and refer to it in other media. So if you have a letter saying. We're going to have this event at such and such a place. Details are here and give the URL so it forces them, okay, if I want to do this, i got to go to the website. And you want to start building an appetite for when they get on your website or on your blog, they see, oh, there's other interesting stuff here. And use other media to refer to the URL so that will tend to draw them. And that's one thing to do. And the other, the other way to do it is to pay them enormous sums of money to go to your website. <laughs> Most churches don't opt for that. Yeah, and, and just as further answer to your question, too, uh, Nick's pulling up the site right now. Oh, okay, so right now the other part is down. I was going to show you an example, but it's a bad example. We, um, Blogger, um, Blogger also allows you to use you – can, you can display Blogger. You can use Blogger as the, as the back end for a website, um, for another website. So that can be just sort of your content management tool, and then um, also in the same uh, – in the same vein, the um, the um, the uh, WordPress, what what Nick and DJ have been pumping, I, I would strongly recommend that. The system that they prefer. Yeah. How much time is involved um, in daily maintenance of a blog? Um, as much or as little as as you want to give it. Um, I, you know, as as Will was talking earlier, I I, I really wanted to, to butt in uh, again, as I'm um, prone to do, and say blogging um, can become addictive, um, and so you have to be careful of that. Um, you know, uh, so uh, you know I, I I'm impressed with with those of us up here who only have one blog and have not you know moved on to multiple blogs. Um, you know, and, and even there, you could give it as much or as little time as you want. Sure, you absolutely could. Um, or an anti ludite site. Um, I spend uh, five to seven minutes a day uh, blogging. Uh, that's an average. There are some, most of the um, I'm a freelance writer, and usually the articles that get published are ones that started as blog posts. And a lot of times when I blog, I'm referring to things that other people have written, and I think this is worth looking at. Go look at this. Um, and that doesn't take much time. The other thing I do, a little trick, is that if I have extra time, I'll write future posts for future days, but I won't post them all at the same time. I'll try to always post one thing a day just at least one thing today, and I skipped yesterday, which is really bad, but I did post this morning. Um, and then sometimes I'll write original content that will usually turn into an article, and uh, that, of course, takes more than five to seven minutes a day. Uh, some of the most popular bloggers, bloggers on the web, um, they're called A-list bloggers, and they generate unique visitors of like 500,000 or even 750,000 visitors unique visitors a day. Uh, one blogger even has more traffic than USA Today, just to give you a sense of how, uh, how much traffic a good writer, a active blogger can generate. And I've heard testimonies of the most active bloggers taking two to three hours a day to maintain their uh, content. Right here. 
Who's bigger than USA Today? Insta Pundit. Insta Pundit. Dot com. Okay. Uh, but people who blog or people who post comments or both. Um, it's a good a good question. I would say most use their real names. Um, it's uh, there are, are a few uh, situations where people do not and have not. We can uh, talk about what those have been. Yeah, um, and you guys can maybe address the ones outside of the church. I, I think th- there are some people inside the inside of the church who have addressed or uh, who who have blogged anonymously, and uh, I follow a cu- I read a couple of them and and follow them and and have come to know some of those people. Um, but it's I think it's harder to create that kind of authentic relationship blogging anonymously. It's, it's fine. There, there's some people who feel like they've got to process some stuff that they might not be able to say, particularly if they're in, in church context. Um, there's a guy that, that I was, whose blog I was reading, uh, frankly, who just lost his, uh, was asked to leave his pastorate because of, because of, because of his blog. Um, so so there's, there's that warning as well. Um, it's a public forum. You're saying stuff and you're putting it out there. Um, so so that's, um, that's part of the reality as well. But... Um, but yeah, there, I, I think there's there's the issue of credibility and authenticity. It's not necessarily as authentic uh, if you're blogging anonymously. Uh, my experience is that most people do uh, blog with their names. Uh, in discussion groups, we have had people who've joined and have wanted to remain anonymous for various reasons. And the important thing I think to stress is that you really respect that. And if they want to stay anonymous, you let them stay anonymous. Um, but most people do, you know, reveal who they are. Um, one really classic example of that is um, a real life preacher who blogged anonymously for years to protect his church and his family, and he referred to everyone by pseudonyms. Then <laughs> he got a book deal, so he, need, he realized he needed to come out and tell everybody who he was, so he did. But um, he had a huge, huge following blogging purely as a real life preacher from a church somewhere in the U.S. Nobody really knew where he was, and, um, but he was a, he was a phenomenal writer. So if you're going to blog anonymously, you got to be compelling because you don't have that additional relational aspect to, you know, it's, you're just Joe Schmo on the Internet. So um, there's that to look at. Sometimes in your comments you'll get people who are anonymous or who claim to be other people. Right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, had, Steve had some problems with his comments where people were blog posting as him in other forums and stuff like that. And it was really nasty for a while. So... Um, it, it is a very open and unregulated space, so um, luckily it's very self-policing. So um, do you want to comment on that at all, Steve, or do you want to take another question? Who's next? Well, that's the, that's kind of the, the self-policing the part of the blogosphere. Um, it's very connected, and so what will happen is if you are not being truthful, you're going to get caught in a lie soon enough. There's enough people watching your blog. There's enough people who maybe know you who are going to stumble across your blog and be like, I know this guy, and he's not who he says he is. So you got to, I mean, hopefully nobody's out there going to intentionally lie in this room, but um, you got to be careful because it's a public forum, and anyone can comment on your blog, and anyone can track back you and kind of point you out and expose you, you know, if you're not being truthful. So um, there, there is a self-policing aspect. People watch each other's backs, and people are looking for, the truth, and so they, they will seek it out, and they will try and find, and they'll, you know, if you're, like, blogging as someone else, and your domain is registered in your name, they'll find it. They'll, who is you? And they'll find your real name, and they'll find your address, and, you know, so it's, like, it's very, very hide to hard on the, or h- hard to hide on the Internet, um, because you may use that, that pseudonym somewhere else, and your name's associated with it, so somebody's going to find you out eventually. Google's very powerful in finding out who people really are. This is another reason why I would recommend you read the book Clue Train Manifesto. Um, it's just the, the idea that, that a lot of the structures that may have um, represented the way we think and, and acted um, ha- are, are sort of eroding. Um, because I know, for example, like if I get a comment and it's really harsh, the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll click through their links and I'll go to their site and see if they're really even a person. 
and see if they really even, and then I may email them or reach out to them and say, hey, got your comment. First of all, thank you for it because that's keeping me in check. Um, and then, hey, what were you thinking when you said this, right? And if, they, if they're not willing to be in conversation with me, well, then that's great, right? But, but see, right away, there's, there's all these new mechanisms for, for uh, relationship and for authenticity, and there's a, we're going to figure out right away who that, um, who that person is and whether they're even, an, even an authentic member of the community. So that also goes back to what I talked about before. Are these people really authentic members of the community, or are they just sort of coming in from the outside and trying to sort of colonize the community? Yeah, question back there. Could, could you, I'm sorry, I... Okay, so the question is, is there a need for PKI or any other security mechanisms? PKI is, um, is, a, is just a, a method of, in, of, a na of ensuring who the person's identity is. So, so the question is, how do, you make, how do you know who the person is, and how do you, how do you sort of m verify someone's identity? Um, going back to the, 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 the cyber stalker that I had on my site, um, because my um, – uh, blog is through movable type. They have a service called Type Key um, that I was able to install um, with the help of friends um, that, that uh, forced people who wanted to comment to register with Type Key and they, then those comments would go be captured but they would, they, they would be moderated by me before they would go up on my, on my site um, and uh, Therefore, I would be able to either, you know, they, they would have to either use a fake email address to, to register with Type Key, um, but it, it, would, it would accomplish nothing because their comment would be seen by, only by me, and I would be able to recognize it as this is fake and delete it before it ever got posted. So that's one example of a technology that works on, on movable type blogs. I don't know if Type Key it works on other blogs, but. Type key is an open system, so I don't know if any other blogs have picked it up, but most systems have a moderation type of feature. Uh, the latest version of WordPress um, starts to identify people as this is a good commenter and lets them comment without being moderated. All new comments are moderated until you basically say this person is cool, let them comment whenever they want. So the, the systems are getting much better. The anti-spam systems are getting much better. So, I mean, it's an evolving technology, and it's – we're we're regularly leapfrog with the people who want to abuse the technology, but each really quickly um, the, the software makers pick it back up, catch it, and start to um, you know make keep people honest. So, but you know in in the end on the internet you never really truly know who anybody is. You only know who they say they are and who others say they are, and that's the that's the power of of linking on the net is if you know Will and you trust him and he says I'm legit then you can probably trust that I'm legit until I prove, you, prove that to be a wrong assumption. And that's really how it works in real life, too, is if you don't know me, you tend to ask people who know me. Or you go to someone that you trust and you say, do you know this person? Are, you know, are they cool? Are they you know, weird? Are they wacky? And they tell you, and you go on that, prom you go on that promise or that um, recommendation until they prove you wrong. And it's very it's similar on the Internet. If you want to find out who somebody is, Find who's linking to them and see what they say he is. Because if everybody's linking and saying he's a liar or fake and a cheat, he probably is. Although not necessarily, because it could be you know some total slander libel thing that they're trying to trying to do. So, one thing that I think is important to think about is that you have to balance giving people barriers to participate versus security. Now, I've never had happen to me what happened to Steve. So on my side, I don't have any kind of registering where you have to register to, um, to put your name on there or anything like that um, or register to be able to make a comment. So I think, it's, I think we have to be careful to balance those two concerns because if you do put up a security barrier of any, to any degree, you are going to – some people will choose not to participate. Uh, so that is a personal decision that you have to make, and it's a balancing act. Um, 
let me add, well, I'll try to ad address the, the, the second question first. Um, um, well, I'm going to get an answer for your other question because I'm curious too. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the, I mean, one of the, th the interesting things about bloggers um, and, and blogging is still, I, I was, it was, was really like the hottest trend on the Internet last year. Um, uh, podcasting is really go going to explode this year. Video blogging, is Aaron Flores would probably argue, is, is here now. But uh, um, the, uh, the bloggers are um, typically uh, influential people in, in culture. Um, and DJ had some comments yesterday, and he can and talk more about this. But um, one of one of the big questions people ask themselves, or, or you know, typically is, you know, well, what do I have to say? I think somebody shared this yesterday. Like, you know, I thought about starting a blog, you know, but what what do I really have to say? And um, those of us who have started blogs um, have started blogging because we've said, you know, I have something to say. Um, I'm just going to put this out there, even if it's uh, just going to be for this small group of people and anyone else who decides to to come along. Um, um, many, many, uh, many of the A-list bloggers, like DJ was talking about, um, talk about politics. Politics is probably the number one topic, um, um, uh, oh, you know, in the blogosphere, the world of bloggers, um, and they, are, you know, are highly influential, and we're highly influential in the last election, et cetera. Um, so there's, there is maybe a, you know, a psychological component there of, of, of a certain uh, type of, of person or a personality trait um, that's that you know says I'm going to do this. I, I have something to say. I think I think our evangelistic passion and motivation um, can you know uh, can drive that for us um, to say you know I'm going to use this technology for this purpose um, um, more so than any uh, you know sort of um, uh, selfish motivation or. Um, well, I have been a follower of Jesus my whole life, um, and um, last year, I came to the point where um, if I didn't change something, I, I was going to I was going to have to leave the church because because there's nothing left for me in the church. Um, and so, um, not not the capital C church because I'm deeply in love with the body of Christ, but the organized, the organized American church um, had little left for me. And so um, for me, blogging has been a place to find other people. Uh, I'm one of the statistics. So when David Bruce quoted statistics last night of all the people who are deeply committed to God but leaving the church, I'm one of them. Um, and so, so part of my blog is is about finding other people, frankly, who are like me. Um, because as I as I talk to people about following God in the way of Jesus, it's really funny, which I do often. And I'm, I consider myself I consider one of my probably my, one of my strongest spiritual gifts is to be evangel is, is evangelism. And um, it's really funny, though, because as I talk to people about following God in the way of Jesus, in, in the American context, inevitably, about the third or the fourth conversation, we have the same conversation, which is, oh, you're not like, and then they name someone. Um, they name a Christian leader that they, or, or, or they, they name some, something that they associate with American Christianity. And so, while I don't, I don't claim to speak for everyone on the, on the podium at all, I'm speaking purely for myself since you, since you asked a, a specific individual question. For me, blogging has been a way to sort of um, work out in public dialogue with the global church some of those questions. Um, and it's been a way to come into conversation with other people. So, so I'm in conversation now with people in Africa and Latin America and, and, uh, and Asia and, and in other parts of the globe who are also seeking to follow God in the way of Jesus, that may, and, and that may not look like what American cultural Christianity looks like. Um, I wanted to make a couple of comments to that 
question. On the positive side, there are people who are drawn to Internet participation in religious events because they're uh, churchless Christians, uh, like Will was talking about. He may have gone in that direction. And we have a number of folks on in the Faith Maps discussion group that they just don't feel like they have anywhere to turn. They don't have anywhere else to go. And they have developed a strong sense of online community where they're mutually accountable. And they, their self-perception is that that's all they've got. That's their church. And it's sad, but that's the reality. Um, some people uh, join, and they're very, very bitter about the church, and that has also segued into bitterness against God. And so, But they're still sort of hungry, and they want to try to differentiate that. Okay, what, what do I need to be mad at, and what do I not need to be mad at? So from a positive perspective, that's why some people tend to spend more time online. From a negative perspective, and specifically to your question, I think there are two dynamics at work. One, it's a lot easier for me to blog about how I should be as a husband and how I should be as a father than it is for me to be a good husband and to be a good father. And in evangelicalism, we have a tendency to think that spiritual formation occurs primarily by information transfer. And from that perspective, with the Internet lowering the cost of information as the printed word did, then as radio did, then as television did, and now as the Internet is doing, as the cost of information gets lower, it can have the negative effect of us looking, oh, look, it's easier for us to get all the information out. We'll be incredible Christians because we'll have all this theology and all this propositional pre uh, presentation of the gospel and we think that that's going to transform people. Now, hear me carefully. I am not saying that there should not be information transfer. I am not saying that propositions are not important. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it's not enough. And it's easy for us to be online because it's just a world of words. It's a world of words, and it's very comfortable to be in a world of words and to not have to actually do anything. And so that's one reason why we can be drawn to the Internet. The second thing is a man, uh, and I think it's more, I think men are more susceptible to this. I think women are to a certain extent too. Uh, in November of 2003, I very intentionally ramped down the amount of time I personally was spending blogging, working on my website, and moderating my discussion group because I realized that when I'm in my computer and I'm online, I'm in control. I'm the moderator of a huge group. It's my website. It's my blog. I'm in control. And I like that, and it could be addictive because you have that feeling of this is my world. And I realize this is messed up, and I change my priorities. So I think that's one reason why people tend to stay online, because it's, or two reasons, because it's very information-based, and that's very comfortable for us. And secondly, because we're in complete control of the world we create through our online friends, through the websites we visit, through the blogs we look at, and the discussion groups we're in. I'll cite one statistic about uh, bloggers. 70% um, of blog readers are influentials. Those are the people that are articulate and networked, the 10% of Americans who set the agenda for the other 90%. So bloggers blog because they have something to say. What reason uh, is more of an individual psychology. So it can, uh, each one of us have a different reason for why we blog. Every blogger has a reason for why they blog. But they, they're supposed to have something to say, and, and the uh, audience will weigh in on whether what they have to say improves the noise or is just noise. Let's take some more questions. This one. Okay, the question is, how, with 8 million blogs out there, what is the way to find a specific person like myself or to find a specific topic? Well, search engines are uh, incredibly uh, powerful in indexing the web, and then there's also search engines that index specifically just the blogosphere or the world of blogs. So uh, one of the ones that we talked about yesterday was Technorati, and Nick, Nick has put it up on the screen, and he can... Tell more about what Technorati can do. Um, let me just quick open with any search engine. Seriously, search engines love blogs because they're content heavy. They're, 
individual posts are all about one subject. They're interlinked. So search engines love blogs. That said, Technorati is probably one of the main, um, the best known blog search engines. They call it searching the world live web instead of the world wide web. In this, um, basically what happens is when you post a blog post, um, most software and most top A-list bloggers ping Technorati. Basically, you send them a little packet and say, I updated. Check out my blog. So the computer goes and crawls your blog. Um, I'm trying to think. So let's say, well, let's look for evangelism and spell it right. Click. Oh, yeah. Oh, where did Rusty go? Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Who got booted? Um, so you can see here that um, somebody posted about evangelism referencing Pope John Paul II eight minutes ago. That's how fast Technorati puts it in its index because that person let Technorati know I updated. Google will get around to that page eventually, but Technorati gets it right away. And it will follow all the links on that post and index anything it finds there. So um, this is, if you really want to find out what bloggers are talking about, Technorati is a great place to go. Any subject, it'll tell you who's talking about it. And then what's really cool is um, here, this is called their Cosmos. So this is this blogger, um, I'll Sleep Will You Drive is the name of their blog. They have seven links from five sources. That means seven people are talking about this post. So you click on that, and it shows you who's talking about that blogger. This is how you can find out if someone's legit. Let's go find them in Technorati, find out who links to them. And so this is going to find people who link to polio.blogspot.com. So it's going to find people who reference him or her. Um, so this is everybody talking about, well, I guess his name is Jeremy. And um, so you can like see here who's talking about him. And then you can see who's talking about them. And on and on and on ad infinitum until you're, you know, fall over dead. <laughs> it, it never ends. There are 8 million blogs and they're all interlinked. You can crawl them all from everywhere else. It's just phenomenal. It's like a little internet kind of thing. It's a sub-web of, of everything that's going on out there. Do we want to cover RSS, guys, or we're running really tight on time? Cover questions? Can we do? Okay. That's a good question. Um, has anybody, has it happened to anybody? Oh, repeat the question. The question is, what happens when somebody comes to Christ on your blog? What do you do with them then? Okay. I'd like, I'd like to answer that because, because um, well, yeah, it be, in part because it, is, it has happened to me. I, it wasn't a person that, that came to faith, but, but I direct people to church, churches all the time. Um, my concern is, is maybe more with, the, with what's considered the organized church. Um, at least for my for myself, I'm in a conversation that's called the emerging church. So, so um, a lot of my eff my personal efforts are are in creating sort of radical new communities of faith, not not abandoning the church, but but creating new communities of faith that are compelling and that call people out to communal faith, to, to a new kind of to back to the to the radical call of Christ. Um, and there are some great um, there are some great places that um, have some communities of faith. Um, listed um, one is emergent village uh, emergent village um, now now I'm, I'm showing my bias here um, for emerging for the emerging church but emergent village has a few um, churches listed on it um, and then um, actually Karen Ward's what is um, what is Karen's yeah no 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 but it's her, it, deep throat is the other one um, you know what? I'll, I'll have the. Uh, there's a couple church finder links that I'll have. Um, I'll give to Nick and send them, uh, and, and he'll post them when he posts his um, his overall. And yes, Gink actually Ginkworld.net is also another uh, another really great church finder. Um, 
I'll just I'll just mention this: the Internet Evangelism Coalition um, that uh, Dr. Sterling Houston is the chairman of has been um, developing a church referral system, and it's something that a number of ministries are now linking into, and it's something that you can contact the IEC about, um, which is a, a, a zip code based search for um, referring um, people to a local church. Um, and so that's a, a web-based you know, um, ministry tool that's, that's becoming available, and the, the Internet Evangelism Coalition is kind of uh, uh, supporting that and sponsoring that. I see Alan back here. The uh, Alan Bieber from Campus Crusade for Christ, very involved with the IEC. His caveat there is is that this that database right now is not weighted, um, so the search results are just um, um, are, are just coming up based on location. Um, the, the 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 vision is and the goal is to weight that um, by uh, churches that have uh, been involved with and shown uh, um, vision for evangelism. And discipleship and and, and 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 bringing in new believers. Um, so, I just want to say that um, if you're looking for a church, you like find out where they live. Look for someone in that town who blogs. Find a, a blogging pastor. Read his blog. See if you feel that that would be the right church for that person. Or ask that pastor. Say, hey, I've got this person. They come out of a Lutheran background. They've come back to faith. Where in your town should I plug them in? Where's a good place? Put on your blog, say, I'm looking for a, a, a Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching Lutheran church in Poughkeepsie. Does anybody know of one? You know, ask the blogosphere for help. Ask other people for help and say, hey, where can I plug this person in? You don't have to mention their name. Just say, I need somewhere to plug this guy in. Put the word out. There's a, there's a huge network of Christians online. Somebody's got to know somebody in that, in that town who can say, yeah, you know, First Lutheran is the best place. You know that that's a great church. Send them over there. They'll, they'll welcome. And then if you can, contact that pastor and let them know the person's coming, so that they don't get lost when they walk in that door. So, without depreciating inordinately the programmatic approaches that have been discussed, which I think are totally legitimate and we need those, I, I like Nick's answer especially because you're the answer. In other words. Use your resources, you know, use whatever you can to find somebody in that state, in that area, so that you can make a personal connection. Because, you know, people, people want that personal connection to be able to go into a church. Uh, they want someone to recognize them when they get there. I did an experiment when I was on staff with a, a church up in Baltimore where I went to the foyer of a large, growing uh, church and intentionally I did this as an experiment. I went there, I got a cup of coffee, and I stood in the lobby for 15 minutes and it looked stupid. And, uh, but it didn't look scary stupid, just looked my normal stupid. And no one talked to me, no one walked up to me, nothing happened, you know. And that is so typical, and that was the comment I, that we received at our church, that that would happen with us. So that human connection is, is absolutely critical. One, one of the, uh, and to your question in just a second, but one of the theological frameworks you might wrap around this is, is comes out of John 14. So, so if you recall, John, uh, in, in the beginning of John 14, Jesus, or John, in John 13, Jesus just told them, all the, the disciples, all this sort of scary stuff. And then he tells them that um, there's, there, he, he gives them a future hope, right? He says, he says I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's a beautiful promise of, of a, of a future hope. But then what does he say? He says, he says, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Right? We all know this verse. I'm seeing a lot of you even repeat it with me as, as I say it. So why did he say that? And why did he say it that way? What was the intentionality of the order? And it seems to me that the intentionality of the order was, was so, that we, so that we do it in that order. See, see, for the most part, the way we've done evangelism... And the way I learned evangelism growing up and, 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 and the way I, I 
even taught evangelism as a pastor was we, we present truth, and if people come to truth, then they get to come into the way. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I am the way. Come to the way, and what will you find? You will find truth. And from truth, you will have a transformed life. And to the Hebrew mind, what did life mean? It meant just a radically new way of thinking. And so to answer your question, which I think is a great question, it seems to me that we need to be thinking about how to get people plugged back into the way, get people plugged back into radical communities of faith, back into, commu- back into communities. And that comes when we are part of communities as well. And I think we all sort of touched on that. When we're all linked into communities, when, when as Stephen said, we take responsibility for, for that person all the way through. So I, I figure out, if somebody contacts me and they're in Paducah, Kentucky, I figure out, I don't know anybody in Paducah, but I find somebody in Paducah, and I figure out somebody that's seeking to live out the, the, the way of Jesus in Paducah, and then I connect them and I say, this guy contacted me on my blog. I, I don't know you, but let's have a conversation, and I want to put you in touch with this guy. Any other questions? Uh, just for Rusty's sake, it was Ibrahim. So the Ulam tribe is now down to two, and the merge is, is just got to be, you know, right around the corner. Okay. Well, um, the, the question is, um, if blogging can be addictive and if it can potentially be pulling people out of, out of the church, should we even be doing it? And I think that's a mis, um, misunderstanding of, of a couple of things that we were saying earlier. I, you know, I was kind of being facetious with the addictive uh, comment. Um, uh, it... So don't take that too literally. Um, the uh, the question of of of, it, of of the internet pulling people out of of the church. I don't I don't think that it's the internet that that is responsible for that. Um, that is the cause of that. Um, so I think the dynamic of blogging is it exposes what is already happening in a in a person's life. And so for someone that would choose to leave the church as a part of their increasing following of Jesus Christ, um, blogging exposes that because it puts your thoughts and ideas out in the open as a part of your processing. Uh, Blogging can also enhance church communities. So, for example, there's a church um, in Kansas City, Missouri, called The Well, where they have their community, their members in the church, blogging, and it enhances their relationship and enhances their incarnational relationships because they're talking during the course of the week. Most of us in the United States have commuter churches rather than commuter community churches where you only see each other uh, a few times a week at best. And to have ongoing conversation on a more regular basis, even on a daily basis, can enhance those uh, relationships and enhance the church community. So I think the opportunity is actually more of an enhancing, and it drives people towards what's actually uh, reveals what's happening in a person's heart. Um, yeah, I guess to, to totally agree with uh, DJ and, and to enhance that, um, it seems to me that, for a, for a church, the American church, that, that prides itself on being Bible-believing Christians, we, we don't talk about the Bible much or, or think about the, the, ap- the application of living out the, the Bible in our faith. And, and so when I read a passage, for example, like Matthew 13 in the parable of the weeds, there's this notion that God is at work 
everywhere. And we may not even recognize where God is at work. But God is always at work. It's really more a question of us recognizing that. And um, one, of the, one of the people that I read uh, talks about the idea that um, our sociology derives from our theology. And, and just to put, sort of put that in simple terms, I think everything we do uh, is related to how we think about God. And um, so, so what's, it seems to me at least what's happening in the church, and, and actually if you look at the George Barna numbers, for example, the, the American church is in decline. People are less likely to go to church and to be a part of church and less likely to be part of communities of faith, less likely to be in relationship with other Christians. Um, and, so, and so you can, there's a, t- there's a tendency to want to say that, that blogging can, can enhance that or can drive that. Or there's a tendency to look, or, or I would look at blogging as simply a, a tool, which is, which is a conversation tool that is about what's happening in the culture. And if... <coughs> If we're presenting God as an individualistic God and not as a communal God, then it seems to me that the outcome of that is that 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 we're going to have people that are less likely to want to live in church in, in church community and less likely to want to live in, in relationship with each other. And so blogging may, may be a place where people can kind of talk about that, um, but but it's not necessarily driving that move toward that. That in fact it's really more just kind of chronicling chronicling it. That's my perspective on it, at least. Thank you. The question is, uh, isn't blogging what it's actually doing? Isn't it drawing people away from the church instead of having them stay in the church and focus on the church and fixing the church as it is? Is that an accurate summary? Okay. I have, and for what it's worth anecdotally, I have never ever met someone who's left the church because they liked the online, what's going on religiously online better. I, I personally have never even heard of anyone like that. Everyone who's, um, the four years I've been doing this, as far as the discussion group, which is uh, where I've gotten most of my connections with with people online, they have already made that decision. They have already left the church, and now they're in a position where they're like, listen, I'm into God, I'm interested in God, I just hate the church. And I, I I, I can't live with this organization as it is today, at least where I am right now. And some of those people are also going, and I don't even know about God anymore, but some hunger has brought them to faith maps. I mean, obviously, if they're coming to that site, they have some kind of hunger where they're looking for it. And our um, orientation and how we work with someone like that is to deal with them where they're at and where they are, where, where they are, which is dealing with us in this virtual environment. And we want to move them back into face-to-face community because we... We believe that they are hungry for that face-to-face community. It's, it's sacramental. It's something that they, they must have, and that is the ideal. And some people, you know, that happens with, and with some people it hasn't happened yet, but we're still working on it in all the means that we've been talking about in terms of, for myself, my personal involvement with contacting people in that area, sleuthing out churches, trying to find or using one of these other programmatic solutions that, uh, people have talked about where you can do a search on a zip code and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's an arbitrary distinction, and we wouldn't be serving you well if we presented the Internet as an alternative to church. It's not an alternative to church. It's an alternate expression of the kingdom. It's another way in which God's kingdom is breaking out in the 21st century. It doesn't replace the church. Yeah, I would just say if you're hearing us talking about um, folks who have left the church, it's um, probably because that's, you know, lowercase c. Um, it's, it, that, that's um, the conversation that we're, a lot of us up here are most involved with. 
but there are people who, there are, uh, you look at Barna statistics, there's huge numbers of people who are completely unchurched, have no church background whatsoever. And, um, and what we're, what, you know, I think what, we, what, what we'd want to encourage you in is knowing your audience and knowing that your audience out there is going to be, there are going to be people who are unchurched. There are going to be people who have, who were churched and have left the church. And, um, and, and, and blogging is just another tool it's a, um, to, to communicate with people. I, I like how Will has put it in that sacred space on the Internet where, you know, uh, he said yesterday, you know, you, you, they're, they're, for that one moment in time, they're going to be sitting in front of their computer screen looking at something that you've written or you've posted. And you have an opportunity there to communicate something about that, 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 that brings the, the love and the truth of the gospel to them. And uh, um, so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, you know, yeah, the church on, or move, moving the church to, to some virtual, you know, online form. Yeah, I mean, th- there's lots of people who are like, oh, I'd love an e-church. And, and, you know, I'm starting this e-church, and I look at them and I go, are you sure? You really want to do that? Are you sure you want to have a completely virtual faith? Because is that really real? Or is that just a bunch of people who um, don't have the guts to go and live with each other? Because living with each other is messy and dirty. And um, that's what I love about church, is that people are messy and dirty. And, you know, it's, it's living together in community and faith. And um, I lost my thought. Where was it? Okay, I see blogging, not as drawing people away from the church. But it's a safety net just under the church, little c. Our hope and prayer is that by what we're doing, people that give up on the, on the church, little c, don't give up on God. That they, that they maybe hit the safety net and they talk with us for a while and we help them heal. And we plug them in with people who are asking the same questions. And together they journey back towards God. And maybe they f- find a different church that they can plug into. A church that, that they feel that they're, they're being fed at or that um, accepts them despite their brokenness. Um, so that's, that's how I see blogging in, in that regard as far as blogging for the quote-unquote church or blogging for Christians as a, as a safety net to catch the people who fall out because they do fall out. The stats show that, and I've met many, many people who have dropped out of the church, have been wounded deeply by people in the church or even by pastors in the church. And they've fallen out, but they haven't given up on God. They still know God is it, but they're looking for someone who can help them deal with these emotions they're feeling and what, what has happened to them. And, um, and so that, that's, that's my answer to your question, is that I don't see it as taking people out of the church. I see it as restoring them to the church. It takes a little while to get people back in. And sometimes they need to go to a different church because the, the, the pain is just too deep from where they were. So... I think we have to wrap up here, but um, I just want to say, uh, come talk to us. We'd love to keep the conversation and the dialogue going. Go to Nick Siske, C-I-S-K-E dot com, um, and uh, we'll be posting uh, slash blog, and um, and you'll and we'll get the, the links and the notes and stuff. Um, but thanks for coming.